Hi, this is Professor Stefaro, and today's screencast is on science. What is science and how it works? When you think of science, you might think of a big stack of textbooks or a lab clad scientist looking into a microscope. Maybe science to you is an astronomer with their homemade telescope or a naturalist out in the field. Maybe science represents Einstein's equation for relativity scribbled across a chalkboard, or discovery launching into space, or flasks full of stuff bubbling away in a laboratory. Whatever your image of science is, the collection of all of these things represents some piece of science. So what is science? Science is a complex and multifaceted human endeavor that strives to know more about all the stuff around us. It is born out of our natural curiosity and powerful ability to see patterns. From the bridges across the Feather River to movies about space, your smartphone, solar energy, nature, medicine, and agriculture, science is truly all around us. Science can be characterized as a way to learn about the natural world. Science focuses exclusively on nature and natural phenomena. Science asks questions about how things in nature work, how the natural world got to be the way it is. So if you've ever thought about science as just a bunch of facts, and I think that happens for students as they begin to learn the language and important knowledge science has collected. But the collection of that knowledge and the understanding of it is truly the core of science. And instead of a bunch of facts, it is more a path of discovery and investigation. A couple of simple ways to think about science is how we approach it. So there are two approaches that are used to understand natural causes for the natural phenomena in the world. And the first is called discovery science. Discovery science is the quest for the new, a new idea, a new creature, a new process, observing something that no one else has ever seen before using confirmable observations and measurements. There's usually not a lightning bolt discovery. It usually comes out of many years of observation and data collection. So this is an example. A 65 million year old fossil represents the earliest form of life. So they had studied fossils and s digital images of fossils and found the earliest animal life form. That's a discovery. The second type is hypothesis-based science. Here we use data from discovery science to explain science. This requires proposing and testing of a hypothesis. So a hypothesis is a statement about how scientists explain a set of observations. Now remember, science only pursues testable ideas. And so the hypothesis, once asserted, would be tested. And in this case, an experiment was done in which the hypothesis most likely was that chocolate reduces the risk of heart failure. Sounds like a yummy hypothesis to me. And so the experiment here was testable in that they were able to use some kind of experimental procedure to look at chocolate as it relates to heart health. So we solve problems every day by using hypotheses. And an example would be the reasoning we use to answer the question, why doesn't this flashlight work? Using deductive reasoning, we realize that there are two possible reasons. One, the bulb. Two, the batteries. There might be other things we can think of, but let's just keep it to these two. So each of these, the hypothesis must be testable and the hypothesis must be falsifiable. So let's move through the process. In hypothesis one, we think it's dead batteries. So the test that you do for your hypothesis is to replace the batteries to see if that'll fix the problem. And in this case, it didn't. 
So that means that hypothesis was falsifiable. And so you revise it to consider the second one, the burnt out bulb. The test is to replace the bulb. You replace the bulb and the flashlight works. In both cases, the hypothesis could be tested and there was the possibility that we would find that the hypothesis was false. And in science, that happens all the time where we have to redo and rethink what we might believe to be the reason for a set of observations. So a hypothesis is a tentative explanation a hypothesis is not an observation, but rather an explanation for the observation or event. It is an assertion as to why the event occurs. And these explanations are based on observed facts, not casual observations. They're based on facts that are typically developed from previous scientific work. And so the two key elements here are that hypothesis must be testable and a hypothesis must be falsifiable. The scientific method is the description of a process used to learn about the natural world, where observation, forming hypotheses, forming experiments, looking at the literature, forming conclusions, and over time, eventually forming theories. But this is not a linear process. This flow chart here is actually too simple. Let's take a look at this model for how science works. Testing ideas is key to how science works. So the linear description might be how you have thought of science in the past, but I would like to suggest that it is a more interactive process, more dynamic, like a pinball machine, in which a scientist will move back and forth between the various elements of this model, between testing, getting feedback, exploring and discovering other ideas, all of those things going back and forth with testing as the core is a true description of how science works. So consider this model and let's watch the video from our own California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco on how science works. A couple years ago, a group of citizen scientists for the Western Cave Conservancy discovered a large, odd-looking spider in a cave in Southern Oregon. They sent it to scientists in California. Recently, those scientists declared that spider a new species, Trogoraptor, and a member of a new family of spiders. Sounds straightforward, right? Wrong. Science definitely is not a linear step-by-step -step fashion. And science is unpredictable. It's uh, dynamic. And I don't think it ever concludes. It just keeps going. To communicate the real process of science, Judy and her colleagues developed this science flowchart to better explain how science works. You may start in one area and you find the need to communicate with the community of scientists that you work with who might have additional or other ideas and all of that helps to shape what science is and how we go about the process of science. So let's take a look at the Troglaraptor discovery flowchart. It's less like a linear process and more like a pinball machine. Let's follow the path using the spider that the citizen scientists found as the pinball. They sent it to scientist Tracy Audizio, who is very curious about what lives in caves. She examined it for about two hours one night, trying to identify it by making observations and conferring with a colleague. They were stumped. The two researchers worked with the Academy's Charles Griswold and brought the specimen to him. He began his own observations. I looked at it through the vial, uh, not under a microscope, and I thought, oh, this is a brown recluse. It's about the same size, but when I looked at it closely, all the brown recluse characters, that is, uh, various details of its anatomy, were wrong. The eyes were placed in the wrong arrangement. The jaws were wrong. 
spinning organs were wrong. Everything about it was wrong. Science often comes down to trial and error. The scientists shared ideas, and then... Well, first, we went to the books, and it didn't fit anything. After that, uh, we carefully compared the new spider to descriptions of all spider families known in the world today, and we also consulted books on fossil spiders. Along the way, the researchers made hypotheses about what this spider was and what it wasn't. Charles looked at the Academy's collections and others. The more we looked at it, the more we realized that the details were wrong for every known family, living or extinct. What do you do in science when you're stumped? Reach out to the scientific community. You consult your colleagues who are knowledgeable, who know some things better than you do, and uh, present the case for your conclusions, the evidence, and ask, what do you think of this? The word came back that, uh, no, we've never seen this before. They made a hypothesis. We believe it's a new family uh, related to the goblin spiders. But to suggest a new family is a very big deal. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. And the last time this happened in North America was more than 100 years ago. Time for more input from the scientific community. So we wrote the publication. They sent the paper and its conclusions to anonymous scientists. And they also agreed that we'd done a good job. So let's celebrate. Wait, remember what Judy said? And I don't think it ever concludes. It just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And that's true with Trogloraptor. In the Arachnology Lab at California Academy of Sciences, we're very interested in this major group of spiders. And we have a big team of scientists, uh, students, postdoctoral researchers, who want to understand the evolution of goblin spiders. So they're asking more questions, making more hypotheses and observations, doing more testing on Trogloraptor. It has a surprising respiratory system, the way it breathes, the remarkable claws, which uh, caused us to give it its name, are the subject of an anatomical study. Facundo Labarca has actually dissected the feet of Trogloraptor and looked at the attachment of tendons. My PhD student is leading an effort to understand the phylogeny of the haplogyne spiders, especially the goblin spiders, through the use of molecular data. And Trogloraptors in general? Those spiders live happily on in that cave and probably other nearby caves. The caves are protected. So let's look at that process again, sped up this time. <laughs> Pinball machine, right? And this process is true not just for scientists, but the rest of us too. We all do science every day. You know, we all make observations, we ask questions, we communicate with people we know about our ideas, we come back to those original ideas. So I like to think that it demystifies science a bit. Everybody can do science. 